Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Ashbourne Baptist Church to our pre-recorded service. This is uh, intended to be shared on uh, the 10th of May, Sunday the 10th of May, and uh, I'm recording it on the Wednesday, hopefully so we can get it distributed and up on the internet in time for this coming Sunday. Uh, so we're glad you can be listening to this and it's our prayer that God would meet with us uh, through his word, through worshipping him and through prayer too. I'm going to begin by introducing a hymn and then we'll pray and then hopefully we'll uh, link in a recording of the hymn as well. Uh, this hymn was uh, written uh, by a lady uh, who was born in the USA in 1862 and her name was Adelaide Pollard. Actually, she was originally called Sarah, Sarah Pollard, and uh, she didn't like that, so she changed her name uh, when she was a bit older. And uh, as she became a Christian, uh, she always intended uh, to uh, become a missionary, and she prayed long and hard about it. When she was about 40, uh, she went to a prayer meeting of a mission organization that was uh, sending missionaries to Africa and she'd applied and various uh, parts of that uh, procedure had, had gone through and she was convinced that's what God wanted her to do and she went to a meeting of the mission organization and found out she couldn't go and not enough funds had come in it just wasn't possible to send her to uh, Africa and she was absolutely devastated. She felt in some ways perhaps abandoned by God, really felt she was struggling and her whole life had changed before her eyes. And she met with a few other Christians, went to a church prayer meeting and there in this meeting a very elderly lady prayed. And this was the gist of it. It's all right Lord, it doesn't matter what you bring into our lives or take from them. Just have your own way with us. And these words uh, struck Adelaide. And she went back to her home that evening thinking of those words that she'd heard this other Christian lady praying. And uh, the, it made her think of a passage in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18, where we read this. I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he was working a work on the wheel. And the vessel he made out of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter to make it. And as she thought about those words, Adelaide Pollard uh, thought about her own life and experiences. And, and she wondered, perhaps, uh, whether her questioning, her doubting of God had shown a flaw in her life. And she wanted God to remake her, to mould her exactly as he would in her pattern. Sorry, in his pattern, not hers. And so she bowed and prayed to God, asking God uh, to make her into the person he wanted her to be. And these, this poem began to sort of take shape in her mind. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mould me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. And that evening she wrote that hymn, Have thine own way, Lord. She learnt that uh, even as Christians we can be so <laughs> self-centred and uh, self-willed, even when we think we're doing God's work, like her planned trip to Africa. She had to be careful and wanted to know that it was God's will for her and for God to shape her into the person he wanted to make her. In the end, uh, God did allow her to go to Africa. It was about 15 years later. She was in her mid fifties by that point. And she went to Africa, but only for a couple of years before World War I broke out and she had to be uh, evacuated and she went back to England, to Scotland in the end, stayed there for a few years and then went back to America after the war. And she still carried on uh, evangelizing and speaking to people and died at the age of 72. 
a man called George Stebbins wrote the music uh, for the for the hymn and he called the tune Adelaide after her name. Let's pray and then we'll uh, sing as well. Dear Lord God, we do come and bow before you this morning. And Lord, we think of those words recorded by that uh, Christian lady of long ago. Lord, we acknowledge too that you are the potter and we are the clay. And we pray that you might make us according to your pattern in just the shape you want us want to make us more like the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you may be at work in us. Lord, we come and bow before you and acknowledge that we too can be so selfish and self-centered. We can get things in such a muddle. Lord, we pray that you may shape us to be more like the Lord Jesus. Bless us in our time together, we pray, as we, uh, different members of Ashbourne Baptist Church, listen to this pre-recorded service on Sunday morning as families, as couples, as individuals. Lord, we pray that you might indeed speak to us, that it wouldn't be something artificial and strange to be some sort of electric recording like this, but Lord, that we might know we're meeting with the living God and that we might know our brothers and sisters at church are listening at the same time. And even though we can't meet face to face, Lord, we do pray that you would still meet with us. We pray, bless us as we pray and worship you. Bless the time we can spend together later on, perhaps on, uh, on Zoom or something like that. Lord, we pray that we would enjoy fellowship together too. You'd keep us knit together as a church. We do feel a bit more distant from each other. We do miss being together. Lord, we pray that you would uh, just cultivate, we pray, those real bonds of love between us as we've been thinking in John's Gospel, that we might love one another as Jesus has loved us. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would bless us in our time together, we pray. Bless those in our church fellowship who are uh, struggling at this time, those who are unwell, those who are worried about loved ones those who have job concerns or finance worries. Lord, we just pray that you would meet with different folk as they have different needs. Lord, intervene, we pray, if it's your will in those situations, we ask. And Lord, we do pray that you would indeed bless us. Lord, we lift up before you uh, loved ones who do not know you. Lord, we are always concerned for them, perhaps even more at the moment with this virus. We do ask that you may have mercy on them, we pray, that we might hear wonderful things of your grace at work in this time of, of tragedy and suffering. Lord, we pray that there might be a real powerful work of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we lift up our children, our brothers and sisters, parents, relatives, friends, neighbours. We think of their names, Lord. We ask you to have mercy on them, we pray. And Lord, we lift up again before you, brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who are suffering so much. Christians in part of the world where to be locked down is so difficult, where they have no income and very little food in the cupboards. Lord, and in places especially where your people are persecuted, Lord, we know things are even worse for them. And so Lord, bring them your peace. We pray that you might intervene if it's your will and bring relief and ease their suffering, we ask. And Lord, that you might be near to them, we pray. And so bless us, we ask, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, we're going to read then from John chapter 16. John chapter 16 is where we're reading this morning, and we're going to begin at verse 5, which is pretty much where we got to last week, and we're going to read through to verse 22. John chapter 16, verse 5. And perhaps you'd like to read it aloud uh, with me. It'll be up on the screen on our video recording as we hear from God's word together. Here's the words of the Lord Jesus. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will not see me again, and again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father, they said to him, What is this he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. And he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me and again a little while, and you will see me? Most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labour, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish, for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Let's pray, and then we'll consider that passage together. Dear Lord God, our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for sending the spirit of truth. And we pray that you might guide us in your truth this morning. Take of those words of the Lord Jesus and may he be glorified. Lord, may you work in our hearts and everyone who listens to this recording. Lord, that we might have our eyes fixed on him and that we might be helped to understand your truth that you give to us. As so, our Lord, we pray that you may be at work, we ask, through the preaching of your word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn back, if you would, to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Uh, the passage we've got to in our uh, sermon through uh, the book of John. And I'll give it the title, Last Lessons, The Gift of the Spirit. In verse 6, we're told the disciples had uh, hearts that were filled with sorrow. Jesus had been talking with them about leaving. Seems to be that the penny had dropped by now, that that really was happening. And the disciples were devastated. And so Jesus, in his last bit of time with his disciples, wants to give them these last lessons and to bring them some comfort. 
and in this passage especially some of it picks up some of the things he talked of before in chapters 14 and 15 as well he wants to talk to them about the gift of the holy spirit and that's what we're going to think about uh, this morning of course it's a bit of a strange phrase that can mean a lot of things the gift of the spirit some people believe that there might be some sort of special event that happens in your life some sort of experience uh, that uh, suddenly transforms you giving you some special abilities or uh, remarkable feelings or some a miraculous sensation that happens but here Jesus is talking about the gift of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, a person, the third person of the Trinity. The disciples were sorry to hear what Jesus was saying. He was talking about leaving. And yet Jesus tells them in verse 7, it's better that he goes away. It's to their advantage that he goes, because then the Holy Spirit would come. So he promises them this remarkable gift that will more than make up for the fact that they're losing, as it were, Jesus. That Jesus is going back into heaven, but they're going to have the Holy Spirit, which will be better for them in the long run. That must have been a strange thing for them to think through. Why is it that the Holy Spirit could only come when Jesus had gone? Well, we're not saying that the Holy Spirit had never been active before. Of course, there were Old Testament believers, Moses, Abraham, David, right the way through to John the Baptist. And of course, they had the Holy Spirit at work in them, um, not just in their inspired writing of Scripture, but in their lives. Those who believed in the promises of the Saviour who would come, of course, it only happened through that work of the Holy Spirit. But something different was going to happen soon. The Holy Spirit was going to be poured out much further afield uh, than uh, just one nation uh, and individuals within it, but uh, right uh, to the ends of the world through the work of the gospel. The Holy Spirit could only come after Jesus had finished his work. Jesus had to die on the cross. He had to rise again. For the Holy Spirit's key role is to apply that to God's people, to apply that finished work of the Lord Jesus and to be at work in the hearts and lives of God's people. Another reason why the Holy Spirit would be better is because Jesus, of course, could only be in one place at one time. Through his ministry, uh, the Gospels tell us oh, Jesus was in Galilee. Jesus was in uh, Jerusalem. He's in a place with the disciples and with other people around. He wasn't everywhere. He was physically constrained to one place. And now it would be better that the Holy Spirit would come because the Holy Spirit could live within all of God's people, spread across thousands and, and millions of miles. And so for us, there's lessons to learn here. As we think about this gift of the Holy Spirit that has come and was poured out on the day of Pentecost and so on, for us, there are lessons to learn, truth to discover about the Holy Spirit and hopefully comfort too. Perhaps there are those who are feeling like the disciples who had hearts that were full of sorrow. And Jesus wanted them to have this truth that it might bring them comfort. So four things we're going to draw out. Firstly, then. He's the Spirit who teaches. Look at verse 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Just incidentally, notice how many times in that verse, verse 13, he, Jesus said the word he. The Holy Spirit is a person he will do these things not it the holy spirit isn't some mystical force or some strange miraculous sensation or what have you he's a person he's going to do things and he will teach he's going to guide you into all truth verse 13 
Interestingly, in verse 12, Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you. I'm going to say them, but not right now. <laughs> he, Jesus was going to teach through the Holy Spirit who would be poured out. And so verse 14, he teaches of Christ. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit teaches of Christ. The Holy Spirit uses the words of Christ and brings them to their remembrance. And the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ by pointing people to his finished work. And again in verse 15, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said he will take of mine and declare it to you. We notice there the whole Trinity is involved. The Father, Son and Holy Spirit all united together and united in teaching the truth. The truth that points to the Lord Jesus Christ, glorifying him through that applying work of the Holy Spirit. There are two special ways that happens. There's the work of inspiration. Look in uh, verse 13 again. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. For the 11 disciples there in the upper room at this time, they were going to be especially equipped by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. He was going to guide them into all truth. When he, Jesus isn't meaning here all truth as in all the knowledge out there in the universe. He wasn't going to download into their brains the entirety of the Encyclopedia Britannica or everything that's on Wikipedia. He's not going to teach them all truth in that sense, but all the truth that's needed, all the truth about Jesus, all the spiritual truth we know, the Holy Spirit will guide the disciples in that. And so they would write down those things uh, in God's word. He mentioned it already in John 14 and verse 26. But the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The disciples, it seems, didn't make notes as they went along in their uh, time, three years or so, with Jesus. But after Jesus had died and risen again and ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit would remind them of the things that Jesus had said. Obviously, they could check it. They did have some memory themselves. It wasn't just a supernatural thing. But the Holy Spirit would make sure they got it perfectly right. It could be checked with the eyewitnesses, too, who were there as well. And it would be written down uh, for us. And notice the way it sort of passed on. In verse 13, the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own authority, but what he hears from me. And so the Holy Spirit would uh, transfer, would teach this truth from Jesus to the disciples. The disciples too would write it down, not make it up of their own authority, but would write it down accurately to pass it on. There's this very careful chain, as it were, in transmitting this truth to us so that we can be uh, full of faith and certain of the truth that we read in God's word. And so helped by the Holy Spirit, they would be guided into all truth so they could write down the very words of God. But for us, there's still the work that the Holy Spirit does of illumination. The Holy Spirit isn't going to inspire me or you to write scripture. That's, that's all been recorded for us now. But he is still at work in teaching Christians. He still does guide us into all truth. And through his work, he opens up the Bible to us that we might really understand what it means. And so as Christians, we pray. We pray as we open God's word that the spirit who teaches might come and teach us, that he might guide us, that he might open our eyes, that he might glorify Christ in us and in our hearts and in our lives, that he might help us remember, bring to our memory the things we need to know, that they might be useful for us in the week ahead and so on. We know the Spirit who teaches, and that's one of the works 
that he does. Secondly, he's the spirit who helps. In verse 7, uh, Jesus gives him that name again. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus was going to send the helper. Back in verse 6, as we've said already, the disciples had these hearts that were filled with sorrows. You meet a lot of people like that in the Gospels, don't you? Think of so many well-known stories of the blind and the lame and the deaf and lepers and outcasts and some particular characters who are given a little bit more information about. Think of the widow of Nain who's there in the funeral cortege for her only son. The Samaritan woman who was feeling guilty and alone and ostracized as she walked out to the well. Jairus, who came to see Jesus because he was racked with worry for his ill daughter. Mary and Martha, who were grieving over the loss of their brother Lazarus. We meet plenty of people in the Gospels who had sorrowful hearts. And then what happened? In each of those stories, they met Jesus. Jesus was physically there, present with them. He came to help them. Perhaps he put an arm around them. Perhaps he, he spoke words to them to bring them comfort, to help them in their situations. And now the disciples are plunged into their time of sorrow. And then they hear these words that Jesus won't be with them. Was their hope shattered? They'd watched Jesus help so many people, but now there was no help for them. Jesus was going. They perhaps thought to themselves, oh, if only Jesus was here. How much these words sank in, we don't know. Whether in a few hours' time, as they watched Jesus be uh, betrayed and arrested, put on trial and crucified, and then buried in a tomb, we know the disciples were still frightened, huddled together in some upper room with the door locked. Perhaps they thought to themselves, oh, if only Jesus were here. But they'd forgotten that he was going to rise again and he was going to send the Holy Spirit. Perhaps sometimes we too can have that same thought. Perhaps when we can be filled with sorrow, the same question and nagging thought can come to our minds, if only Jesus was here. If only Jesus was here to help me. Well, he is. He is with us by his Spirit. Look at verse 16. A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while. And you will see me because I go to the Father. Jesus said those words. The disciples were confused. They discuss it in verse 17 and 18. Jesus knew that they were wondering about it. And so he answers their question then in verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Like a woman, uh, when she's in labour, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she rem no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought into the world. The disciples would have a short term sorrow. They'd be in pain. They'd have a broken heart when they saw the things that would happen to Jesus. But then they wouldn't remember that anymore. They'd be suddenly overtaken by joy. And so he says to them in verse 22, Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. And again in verse 16, he'd already said to them, you uh, again in a little while and you will see me. Now, no doubt Jesus is talking about those resurrection appearances that would happen in a few days time. How he would appear to these frightened, confused disciples and they would see him again. But it's not just that. I don't think. Because look in verse 16 again, where Jesus says, and again a little while, and you will see me because I go to the Father. That's a weird phrase. You'll see me, not 
and then I'll go to the Father, but you'll see me because I go. You'll see me because I go. That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? How are they going to see him when he's gone? Well, they're going to see him through the Holy Spirit. And in verse 22 again, he says, I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. They would have permanent joy that could not be taken away because Jesus would be permanently with them. Not just his resurrection appearances, how he would appear a handful of times to the disciples, but disappearing in between and in the end ascending into heaven, but with them permanently through that ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit who helps, who gives us the very presence of Jesus with us, that can give us permanent joy. And it can only happen because he goes to the Father, verse 16. And he's used that phrase several times before to talk about the fact when he goes to the Father, then he will send the Holy Spirit to us. Again, back in chapter 14 and verse 17, we read this, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Jesus links those two things. The Holy Spirit will be in you and I will come to you through that work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is with us. He's the Spirit who helps. We have the living presence of Jesus with us, a great source of comfort and a joy that no one can take away. Maybe especially at this time, we need to be reminded of that. This COVID um, pandemic has brought a range of experiences. Some are ill, some have been bereaved. Some are frantically worried about loved ones. Some are lonely and isolated, all on their own. Some have been made unemployed. Some have financial worries. Others are overworked. Some people are frightened. Some people are frustrated. Well, in all of those different situations, we may come to have hearts that are full of sorrow, but we have the Spirit who helps. And he brings the very presence of Jesus to us. We are not alone. That's what Jesus said, I am with you. And I will give you that joy. My, your hearts will rejoice. Only that transforming work that Jesus could do through his living power, through that Holy Spirit that he would send to us. The Spirit who helps. Thirdly, then, he's the Spirit who converts. Look at verses 8 to 11. Now, when he's come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you will see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Those are some of the trickiest verses in John's Gospel, people say. A little bit tricky to try and work out what's going on. So when the Holy Spirit comes, verse 8, Jesus says, he's going to convict the world of three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then in the verses that follow, Jesus explains each of those in a bit more detail. So verse 9, he talks more about the, the sin, the conviction of sin, because they do not believe me. Verse 10, he picks up the theme of righteousness again, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And in verse 11, he picks up the theme of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So the Holy Spirit is going to come and do those three things, that convicting work, a converting work. That's definitely one of the things that it uh, shows us. That work that the Holy Spirit does in convicting and converting. Think of the situation for some of the unbelieving Jews at this very time. In a few hours, they're going to participate in crucifying Jesus. 
They didn't believe, verse 9, that was their sin. They did not believe me. They believed Jesus was an imposter, a fraud, an evildoer. They believed they were right in having him handed over to the Romans and put to death as a false messiah. And then, later on, the Holy Spirit would come. And the Holy Spirit would convict of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. And so in verse 9, he would convict those unbelieving Jews that their unbelief of Jesus was completely wrong and completely unsubstantiated. They were wrong. They should have believed him. Verse 10, he'd convict those unbelieving Jews of righteousness. They'd thrown Jesus out, had him crucified as an evildoer. But then he's vindicated for he rises from the dead and they would be aware of this fact that he's gone to his father uh, and they would see him no more. He's been uh, shown to be the righteous one, the true Messiah. And verse 11, he would convict those Jews of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. They would see his victory over, over Satan, over death and over sin. And that would convict them of judgment. Not only that the judgment, as it were, of Jesus showed that he was vindicated, but judgment that would fall on them too. And those things that Jesus says here in John's Gospel are exactly the same sort of things that we notice in a couple of pages time in Acts chapter 2. Peter labours exactly the same points in his sermon on the day of Pentecost. Look in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God through miracles, wonders and signs, as you yourselves know. What's he doing? Convicting of righteousness, that Jesus was right, that their unbelief was wrong. They convicted of sin. Uh, you've taken with lawless hands, verse 23, and crucified and put to death, whom God raised up showing his victory, showing the judgment uh, on Jesus that showed he was the Messiah. God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held uh, by it. Again in verse 30, uh, that he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, talking of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and his victory over Satan. Verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up, of whom we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. And then in his climax, as it were, verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter labours those same points. He convicts of sin that they were wrong to not believe him. He convicts them of, of righteousness, for Jesus has now been exalted. And he convicts them of judgment, that Christ was victorious over Satan and over death. And judgment now threatened them. That's the same message that Paul laboured there. But it wasn't just Paul's message, it was the Holy Spirit at work through it. We read in verse 37, still in Acts 2, that they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the others, men and brethren, what should we do? And Peter says, repent and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we read of 3,000 being saved that day. He's the Spirit who converts there were 3,000 in that crowd of unbelieving Jews, perhaps many of them who'd been there, shouting for Jesus to be crucified. And then as Peter preached, the Holy Spirit was at work convicting of sin, righteousness and judgment. And it ch changed the hearts of 3,000 people as the Holy Spirit convicted them and brought them to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same message then is proclaimed throughout the book of Acts in various places of the Gentiles too. And it now is the message, isn't it, that goes out into all the world. The gospel message for the world. And as we preach, we aim to convict of sin. 
bringing people to repentance, especially that sin of unbelief and rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. We aim as we preach to convict of righteousness, showing people that Jesus is the righteous one that everything about his life shows him to be the Christ, the Messiah, that through his death and his resurrection that proves it, and through his ascension into heaven, the the, uh, position that the, the Father has put him in now. We aim to convict of judgment, showing people that Jesus has defeated Satan and sin and has risen again, and there is judgment to come. Those are key elements, aren't they, in our preaching? But not just that. In our conversations too, as we talk with our children, as we chat to our neighbours and uh, witness to people we know. They're the kind of things we want to write in our tracts, in the leaflets we give out for church and things. It's our work, in a sense, we want to share that message, but it's the Holy Spirit who does the work, isn't it? That through us, even using us, amazingly, as we share that truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit does that work of convicting and converting. And that's our prayer, isn't it? We feel so hamstrung at the minute, don't we? So, so restricted. And uh, we feel we're missing out on so many opportunities that we used to have, even ABC at our TOTS group and our boys brigade, and all the things we might have had planned to do in these summer months, trying to reach out to people. We thought, oh, we can't, so frustrated, we can't do it. But the Holy Spirit can. We're told to stay at home, but there's no one commanding the Holy Spirit to stay anywhere. He can move wherever he wishes, like the wind, as Jesus said. All those people who've heard bits of that message, people who've got Bibles, people who've got leaflets we've given out. We pray, don't we, that the Holy Spirit would remind them, guide them into the truth they've heard and convict them and convert them and change their hearts and give them that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lastly then, He's the spirit who testifies. Still in verses 8 to 11. I said they're quite tricky verses. There's a lot packed into them. Verse 8. And when he's come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, we looked at that already. (laughs) But what does it say? He'll convict the world of sin. It doesn't actually say he'll convict people. Then we could nicely restrict that. It would be an easier way to interpret it, as we have done already, and say, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to convict people, the elect, God's chosen people, uh, who he's going to bring to repentance and faith. And that's, that's true. I think that is what's going on. But he also says he's going to convict the world. And in John's Gospel, that means big scale. That means everyone. He's going to convict everyone on planet Earth. It could also mean not just everybody, but everything. He talks of convicting the world of sin, verse 8, and in verse 11 he talks about the ruler of this world being judged. Everything going on in this world, not just the people, but the, but the work of Satan, the work of his demons, the work of the powers of wickedness, everything at work in this world is going to be brought to conviction too. He's going to convict the world. What does that mean? Well, the word convict as well doesn't just mean to bring to repentance. It does mean that, but it's, it's broader than that. It can also just mean to expose the truth. Uh, we, it uses the same word uh, later on. Paul used it to expose the, the, di- the deeds of darkness and so on. He's the spirit who testifies. He's the spirit who declares the truth. He just says it. This is it. These are the facts. Undeniable. Irrefutable. There is no argument. This is the truth, verbatim as it were, laid down by the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit who convicts the world. He just says, this is it. 
and tells the testifies of, to the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. Sin, they should not reject Jesus. Righteousness, because Jesus is exalted. And judgment, because Jesus has been victorious over Satan. That is it. Boom. As it were. And that's something the Holy Spirit has done when we begin to think about it. <clears throat> From the year zero, roughly, to the year 33, Jesus lived. And he was, to all intents and purposes, a rather obscure Jewish rabbi, who in his lifetime collected a handful, together, a handful of followers, uh, some sort of raggedy band, and then, after living for a mere 33 years, never writing a book or anything like that, then he died and rose again. And that was it in 33 years. And then from the year, roughly, 33 to now, 2020, what is going on? What is going on in these, these years? 2,000 odd years. The Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and the Spirit is at work throughout the whole world convicting of sin, righteousness and judgment. Even if people don't believe it, he's still doing it. He's still at work doing that. And again in the book of Acts we pick up some of these themes of this broader work that the Holy Spirit is doing even among those who are not saved. And even those who, who, who reject it still in Acts chapter four. Well, in chapter three, Peter and John healed the lame man through the uh, through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they're hauled in front of the the authorities again, the same authorities who did reject Jesus. And uh, there they stand before them. And uh, Peter says to them, Acts chapter 4 verse 9, if this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God has raised from the dead. By him this man stands before you whole. He is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter preaches the same sort of message, convicting of sin, righteousness and judgment. But they don't listen. But they are affected by the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men and they marveled. They realized they'd been with Jesus and seeing the man who'd been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they commanded them to go outside the council, they conferred it among themselves and then proceeded to threaten them and so on, that no one should ever preach in the name of Jesus. They were in a way convicted by the Holy Spirit and by these words of Peter. But that didn't bring them to repentance. They still carried on in their rejection. But even in that, they marveled. And they can't deny it. They're sort of wriggling around on the hook, but they do not want to submit and do not want to come and trust in Jesus. But he's the Spirit still who testifies, who's shown them the truth and they reject it and stubbornly carry on, but they're still convicted all the same and exposed in their irrefutable, uh, inexcusable behavior and rejection of Jesus. And we see it in various other places of Acts. In Acts chapter two, it talks about fear falling on everyone, not just people saved, but everyone's aware of what is going on. Again, in chapter 5, it talks about some people being converted and other people being afraid of them and so on. But all people are being affected by the Holy Spirit. That's what's going on in the year from roughly 33 right now to 2020. And how much longer? Well, until the Lord Jesus comes again. When Jesus was here, he preached the kingdom of God is near. And then after his death and resurrection, the king is enthroned, the kingdom is here. 
And through the work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit testifies that God is here. He is at work in this world, for the King is exalted. And so, as Jesus says, the Holy Spirit comes and convicts the world. 2,000 years have passed since the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and that gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the church age, the gospel age, the spirit age. This is the story of our time. Historians love to split things up into little bits. You talk about the Middle Ages and the, the Tudor era and the Roman era and what have you. Sometimes people talk about whether this COVID pandemic is going to become a defining moment too. Whether later on people are going to talk, you know, in years to come about, oh, pre-COVID, this is what was going on. And then post-COVID, everything was different. Well, who knows? Is COVID going to be the defining moment of our generation? Well, the story of the last 2,000 years and any more years until the Lord Jesus returns is the story of the Spirit, the Spirit who's at work, testifying of that truth. And he testifies to all as that amazing turnaround of there being a handful of followers following this obscure rabbi in the land of Israel, to there being millions and billions of Christians right across the world as the gospel goes out into all the nations. It is a testimony to that living work that the Lord Jesus is continuing through his spirit and through his people. Whether you believe it or not, the Holy Spirit testifies that this is indeed the truth. And so, before we finish, can I urge you to believe? Think of those Jews we just read about in, uh, in Acts, and they saw the truth. They couldn't deny it, but they wouldn't believe. There they were convicted under judgment, and they wouldn't turn to the Lord Jesus in repentance and faith. Please make sure you do. The Holy Spirit shows these things. Ask him to reveal that truth to your heart, to really show you those things that you might indeed be changed by him. Pray that he might soften you to receive those words of his. And then know this wonderful truth of the Holy Spirit who does convert, the Holy Spirit who changes, and the Holy Spirit who will live forever within God's people. And what an encouragement it is for us who are his people to know that Holy Spirit who indeed does teach and the Holy Spirit who helps that he might make us more like the Lord Jesus and that he might glorify the Lord Jesus both here in us and right around the world. Amen.